Let's open our Bibles to Psalms 27 and verse 14. Psalms 27 and verse 14. Psalms chapter 27 and verse 14. The Bible says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. It says, and it shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalms 40 and verse 31. Psalms 40 and verse 31. I encourage us to open to the scriptures. Um, write down the scriptures. Praise God. Psalms 40 and verse 31. If you're there, say amen. If you're looking for it, say wait for me. <laughs> Psalms 40 and verse 31. The Bible says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. What's wrong? Did I say Isaiah? Oh, it's Isaiah, sorry. I wanted to say Isaiah, sorry. Isaiah 40, 31. Sorry, I wanted to say Isaiah. Isaiah 40, 31, the Bible says, But they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. It says they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. One of the things I've realized that characterizes a waiting season in many people's life, whatever it is that people are waiting for, is that when people find themselves in a waiting season, um, one of the things you realize is that their speed and progress in life is often impeded. So you look at the average person maybe waiting for a life partner in the context of our series this month, maybe a lady or a guy, you notice that they get to a point because, oh, now I'm waiting for a life partner, every aspect of their life shuts down. But the Bible is making us to understand here <clears throat> that there are different you know, ways you can wait. You can wait passively or you can wait actively. That's why he says those that wait on the Lord. It simply means it's not everybody that is waiting that is waiting on the Lord. Some can be waiting for any other thing. They can be waiting, you know, on the promise that someone has made to them. You know, it's just like a, a, an undergraduate, you know, who is about to leave school. And he or she just has that confidence that when I get out of school... There's a job waiting for me. Why does he or she have that confidence? Probably because an uncle has promised, when you get out of school, I'm going to give you a job. Now, while there is nothing wrong in that, that is not waiting on God completely. That is waiting on the man's promise. So the Bible is saying here that those that wait on the Lord, they will have their strength renewed. They will have their strength renewed. It simply means they will not be weak. What gets others depressed is not going to get them depressed. So you look at them, he is still single or she's still single. But you can't see it in her disposition. Why? Because there is a strength that comes from within. When the average person is waiting, you can see it in their disposition that this person is waiting. But the Bible is saying if you are waiting on the Lord, your strength should be renewed. You should be able to mount up with wings as eagles. That is, you should, you see, a waiting season actually gives you the opportunity to fly. And I'm going to come to that in some moment. It is not, you see, waiting season is not wasting season. Your life should not be wasting away simply because you are single or simply because you are waiting to get married. That's why he says here that if you, wish, if you wait on the Lord, your strength will be renewed. You will mount up with wings as he goes, then you shall run. Others may be walking, but during the waiting period, it gives you the strength. Because let me tell you, there's many of the things we are trusting God for, releasing our faith for, the things we are trusting God to add to us. Even though there are blessings, there is a burden that comes with every blessing. And many people don't realize that. That's why when the Bible talks about, you know, glory, it refers to it as the weight of glory. Glory has glamour, but it also has weight. And so if you have not developed the capacity to undo the weight, you can get crushed under that weight. 
That's why sometimes you see people who experience a sudden advancement, a sudden progress, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, they stop fellowshipping with God. You know, church now gets below their standard. You know, talking to people about Jesus, you know, they seem to have outgrown that level societally. It's because before that blessing came into their life, they have not developed the capacity to undo that kind of blessing. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? So the Bible is saying when you wait on the Lord, you will mount up with wings as he goes. You will run where others are walking. And you will not be weary. It simply means when you think about the fact that, oh, I don't have this yet. I'm still single and I'm supposed to be married at this age of my life. And let me say this. Age is no proof you are ready to get married. And I hope I'll be able to get to that tonight. You see, someone can be 40 and 50 and not be ready for marriage. And someone can be 20 and be ready for marriage. In fact, more ready than the person that is 50. <laughs> it's not a function of age. There is a place that age, there is a role that age plays. But to say, oh, because I'm, I'm, I'm grown in years, that simply means I'm ready. You, you, it, you can't be you know, so far away from the truth. Nothing can be further away from the truth. So the Bible says that when you wait on the Lord, you will, should not be weary. It says they shall walk, but they shall not faint. It means they will not be discouraged. They will not be discouraged. They will not look at themselves as if they are second-class citizens. You see, the average single person, maybe when they've got into a particular biological age and they are not married, they begin to see themselves as being inferior to their colleagues that are married. Say, so at this age in my life, I, I, I should have been married by now. <laughs> you know, so unconsciously, uh, they begin to detach themselves from their friends that are married because something now tells them that maybe the reason why I'm still at this phase of my life, why, you know, I still have MISS instead of MRS is simply because, you know, I'm not good enough. But the Bible is saying if you wait on the Lord, it says you will not be weary. You will not be weary. There are two types of waiting. Very quickly, let's write it down. Number one is the one you choose. And number two is the one that is forced on you. Two types of waiting. Number one, the one you choose. Number two, the one that is forced on you. Let's talk about the one you choose. A man or a woman can decide out of understanding. They can choose to wait. Even though everybody is saying, ah, by now you should have been married. By now you should have done this. By now you should have done that. But because this individual, right, has a level of understanding and knows something that others do not know, they decide to wait. So a man can choose to wait. And you know, the funny thing about our environment is that when an individual is not doing something everybody is doing, when an individual is not following the bandwagon, everybody just unconsciously thinks something is wrong with that person. So why now, by now, you should have brought a wife home. When are we going to meet your wife? <laughs> Somebody struggling financially, you're asking him for a wife. So by now, you should have brought a husband. When are we going to meet your husband? Someone that if you go to her room, she's still staying under your roof, you go into her room, it's as if a volcano eruption happened in that room. She can't even take care of a room. How can she be a homemaker? You don't pay attention to that. All you are just concerned about is, when are you going to bring your husband home? When are we going to meet him? So an individual, you see, can do a self-assessment. Everybody can lie to you, but one person you must never lie to is the person you see every time you look into the mirror. You must not lie to that person. The moment you start lying to that person, the moment you cannot be honest with the person you see every time you look into the mirror, <laughs> and in case you don't understand what I'm saying, the moment you cannot be honest with yourself, you are wrecked. Because you may lie to everybody, but when you are alone by yourself, you must be able to tell yourself the truth. You must be able to weigh yourself on the scale and say, this is what I'm worth. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So the first type of waiting is the one you choose because of wisdom, because of understanding. Just like some of the things, you know, I mentioned last night for those of us that were at the singles dinner, that there are times in life that there are certain things you just have to put in place before you start thinking of marriage. Or else, 
you are not going to enjoy it. Certain things need to be in place. And when you have an understanding of those things, it is wisdom to say, you know what? I choose to wait. I choose to wait. Everybody may say, ah, but at this time now, you see, ah, <laughs> you should have done this. You have done. Well, what else? As a man, what else is left? Because of environmental limitation. People believe that the moment you are earning money, you have a house of your own, Maybe you have a car. The next thing is, you should have a wife. You are out of school as a lady. <laughs> In most places, you don't even have a job. They don't expect a woman to have a job. As long as she's out of school, she has one NYSE, she has taken picture with compassion uniform. <laughs> you are marriageable. But wisdom makes you to know when you as an individual should choose to wait. The second type of waiting is the one that is forced on you. And sometimes, God can make you wait. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? It is not every waiting that comes from the devil. No, 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 no. It's not every wait that comes from the devil. Sometimes, God makes his people because, you see, when God is... Uh, uh, and you see, as a believer, you should be able to discern when you are going through a season that you know that it is God that is orchestrating this. And you don't fight it. In that season, what you should do is go to God in the place of prayers and say, in this season of my life, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? It might be that God wants you to see certain things or he wants to reveal certain things to you before you get married or he wants you to know certain things about yourself so that you can make the right choice. I'm always reminded about a friend of mine when we were in school, you know, whose parents were about to divorce in 300 or 400 level there about. You know, that day she was crying and I was like, what, what's wrong? You know, and she said, her parents are about to divorce. I said, why? What happened? He said the mom, you know, the dad decided to go into ministry, you know, that he had always wanted to go into ministry, you know, but he, he's a medical doctor. The mom is also a medical doctor. They met in medical school, you know, and the woman said, I didn't marry a pastor. I married a doctor. That this one you are saying you want to become a pastor, I don't understand. So it's either you choose pastoring or you choose me. I didn't, I didn't hear the, uh, the, the, the end of the story because they were still in that process till we left school and we kind of, you know, fell apart. But you see, that kind of an individual, because you see, God does not hide himself from us. If there had been a season of his life where he had spent time with God, God would have revealed that to him. Even if it's not something that should happen immediately, it is something God will make him understand that this is in your future. And so that will influence the choice he will make. I've always known that I will be a pastor. You know, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't know that it was going to happen, you know, um, at this season of my life. But I'd always had that, you know, inclination. I'd always known. I'd always known. I didn't know it was gonna, I was going to be a senior pastor or pastor in the church. But I'd always had the tilt for ministry. I'd always known. And that happened in the season of my life, you know, during holidays when everybody would go home after school. And I would stay back. Those were seasons of my life where I, you know, a lot of scriptures were impressed upon my spirit. Because when everybody would go home, you know, to spend time with their family, I would stay back in school. I would study God's word. I would read books. And I would pray hours on ending. Pray out because there was nowhere to go anyway. The school I went to was not like, like a school that was inside town, you know, like many schools in Lagos. <laughs> of you that went to uni, like, you didn't really go to school. <laughs> Oh, NIJ, that's not school that you will travel into the bush. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That when school is on holiday, everywhere is like a ghost town. That's the kind of school I went to. So there was nowhere to go. During holidays, if you come out of the ocean and say you want to get to town, you can wait one hour on the road before you see any taxi. One hour. <laughs> because the economy of that environment was determined by the students. So everybody knew when school was on break. So not same taxi man will just come and just drive down, except by all you see were farmers, stack illiterate. So that the people I want to be spending time with. So I had no choice. I had to spend time with God. And I'll never trade that season of my life for anything in the world. Never. 
It was during that season of my life I began to have, you know, get glimpses into the future. Things that might, that, you know, likely to happen. Things that have not even happened that God has showed me about 10 years to come. You know, the first time Gateway came to me was when I was in 500 level, 400 level. That was the first. I wasn't praying that, God, when I get to leave school, I will start. No, it does. I wasn't praying that God I wanted because, in fact, then I was already thinking of, you know, you know consulting and all those things already on, in, on that path. I wasn't praying for it. You see, so sometimes God can make you wait because he knows that if you don't get certain things before you make that choice, it's going to affect the choice you have made. So someone going into ministry, the kind of person you will marry will be different from someone going into politics. Do you understand what I'm saying? So those two types of waiting, you need to realize the one that you choose. And then we say, and now when you realize that, you see, God is the one, as it's where it seems as if he's the one forcing that waiting season on you. Then you now need to get to the point where you realign. And you say, you know what? This is not only going to be something God is forcing on me. I'm going to choose to wait. It's not that time you will now be looking for, ah, somebody should just say yes to me. Somebody should just say yes. Anybody that is available. <laughs> you know, some people like that. Let somebody just say yes. Or let any guy just, once the guy just asked, he's asking, before the guy, maybe the guy wanted to ask, please, um, do you know the way to, just say, <laughs> once he just said, you don't even know what he wants, so just say yes. Uh, yes for what? <laughs> I thought you said you wanted to. <laughs> Praise God. And your attitude during the waiting season will determine the quality of your marriage. Your attitude matters. Your attitude matters. St. Thomas of Aquinas was the one that said the person is said to be patient because he acts in a praiseworthy manner by enduring things which ought him here and now and is not unduly saddened by them. So that's what it means to be patient. Your attitude in a waiting season matters. The attitude. Waiting is not just ah, when it happens. No. Waiting is staying where God wants you to be being in the center of his will with a good attitude. That's what it means to wait. Because a lot of people are waiting, but their attitude is so rotten. You know, they are fighting, they're moving against the grain. They can't just wait to get out of that season of their life. Hebrews 10 verse 36 to 39. You can open to it if you have your Bible. Hebrews 10, 36 to 39. The Bible says, but we have need of patience. That after you have done the will of God, that you may receive the promise. Did you see that? What is lacking in many believers' work of faith is patience. It's patience. Many claim to have faith. A true man of faith is a man of patience. You can't tell me you have faith if you're an, if an impetuous person, you know. If something doesn't happen at your own timeline, you know, you develop a bad attitude, you know, you are so irritable. No, you don't have faith. You don't have faith. The Bible says, he that believes shall not make haste. So he's saying here that if you have need of patience, patience for the believer is not an option. It must be a lifestyle. It says, after you have done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. It simply means if you don't have add patience to the equation of your life, you may never receive what God has you know, in store for you. He says, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. He says, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Be ye, says, but we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Did you see that? So when people say, one of the things I've realized is when people are not patient, they will get themselves involved in things they will regret later. When you are not patient, you will do things that deep within you, you know it is wrong. But out of impatience, you will do it. Patience makes you gratify yourself in the immediate without thinking of the consequence of what you are doing now. That's why the Bible says we are not of them that draw back. When you lose patience, you draw back. When you lose patience, you drop back from the things you have believed. When you don't, you see, when you throw patience away, you begin to make decisions that in retrospect, you begin to wonder, how did I make, how did I get myself into this? Somebody hear what I'm saying tonight? 
That's why the Bible says you have need. You have need. You have need of patience. It is not a want. It is a need. And there will never be a season. You see, even if someone is there say, okay, me, at least me, I'm engaged. I don't need, you know, I don't need patience. I don't need to wait. Let me tell you this. You will still need patience. If you don't need it now, you will need it in marriage. <laughs> There will never be a time in your life where you will not need patience. Certain things might not be delayed in your life, but let me tell you this. Everybody will go through a season of waiting. Everybody will. Every, it's just that what we wait for will be different. But you will. <laughs> you will. When God was, you know, telling Abraham about his promise for his, you know, seed, the children of Israel, he had given them the promises. He said, you know, this land will be theirs. But God told Abraham, he put, you know, a clause to it. He said, but they will have to wait for 400 years. Does that sound like something God will say? It sounds dead the devil. How can I wait for 400? <laughs> but God said they will have to wait for 400 years. When the children of Israel were in Babylon, uh, when they were in captivity, I'm not sure if that was Babylon because they went into different captivity. Every time they would sin against God, God would send them into captivity to go, to go learn some lessons. Because then they didn't have the Holy Spirit anyway. So God will have to teach them through circumstances. A prophet arose and said, by this time next year, there will be freedom. He started prophesying. Say, you see, you would have left captivity, done this, done that. So the original prophet arose and said, what that prophet is saying, don't listen to him. He said, God, according to God's order, we are still going to stay in this nation, maybe for another 40 or 50 years. He said, so if you want to marry, marry. If you want to start a business, start a business. He said, you are taking the yoke of people's neck, yoke of wood and putting a yoke of iron. He said, it's not time for them to leave. Doesn't that sound like the devil? Yeah, it's not time for us to leave captivity. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, that was what God said to Moses. When God was going to send Moses, you know, to the children of Israel as their deliverer, he said, now I've had their cry. He said, I was not hearing before. For 200 years, for 300 years. He said, now I'm sending you. Because you already told Abraham. So don't think there is something wrong. Don't think something is wrong. Some people even believe that. He said that God is not answering me. And get the anatomy of effective prayers. <laughs> I pray, 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 pray. What else? <laughs> See, if you don't understand this thing I'm telling you, you will dip your hand into things. That's why you see someone that used to be a Christian going to the house of a herbalist. That's, why do you think young boys do yahoo? It's impatience. It's impatience. Say, no, I must drive the car now. Which one will you drive in the future? When you have driven your future up front. You see, there is a joy and fulfillment that comes with progress. And that is what many of the people engage in fraudulent activities. That's what they are robbing themselves of. What you should grow into, you want everything now. That's why a lot of them are eventually depressed. Because there is nothing to grow into anymore. Nothing to grow into anymore. So Joyce Meyer who said, patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. Patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while you are waiting. I want to tell us certain things you need to note. For those of us that are single, you know, I'm saying this from the book, How to Find the Right Person to Marry. If you don't have a book as a single, I'd encourage you to get it. Six things you need to know about being single. Number one, singlehood is not a cause or a stigma. Because our environment makes us to believe that if you are single at a particular age, maybe you have a cause. They even tell you, ah, are you sure you won't go for deliverance? Hmm. You should go and wash your head at the river. <laughs> it is not a cause. It is not a cause. It is not a cause. Neither is it a stigma. In fact, let me tell you, sometimes being single is a blessing in disguise. Like what I told us some moments ago, you say, while you are single, there is a pace at which you can move, that you can't move at that pace when you get married. That's what Apostle Paul was saying to one of the churches in his letters. He said, I'm not saying that, you say, he said, if any one of you is burning with passion, he said, let him get a wife. He said, but I wish you can stay as single as I am. 
He said, because there is a burden that comes with being married. That's a balanced message. He said, there is nothing wrong in getting married. He said, but I wish I could relieve you of that burden. Because there is a burden. You see, people don't tell you this. But trust me, there is a burden that comes with it. There is. As a single, independent single, if you decide to leave your house <laughs> and come back, you guys life because I said independent because some people are single but they are not independent and if you are not independent you are not truly a single you are not you think see let me tell you this not being married does not mean you are single you begin to enjoy what it means and have an understanding of what it means to be single when you are independent that's when you start understanding what say say if you are still living with your parents you are not single whether man or woman you are not don't let anybody deceive you you are not. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> you guys don't like to hear that, but you know, I will tell you the way it is. If you have not started making your own income, you are not single. Now, maybe I should put a caveat to that. If you are still living with your parents, but you are earning your income, but you decide, you see, you can, you have the capacity to live alone, but you choose not. You are single. But that you don't have the capacity. And you are saying you are single. No, no, no. You are not. You are, that one is the one that is forced on you. <laughs> so God wants you to learn some things. Praise God. The second thing you need to understand about singlehood is that single should be enjoyed and not endured. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Like what I, one of the things I said yesterday at the single dinner, I mean it. Those of you that stood up, I know your face. And I've given you four months. Praise the Lord. You can't be, I can't be pastoring you. You are a single. You are working. And you don't have an international passport. I don't want to pastor non-entities. No. Even if you come as a non-entity, God does not call anybody. Society, there's a way society classifies some people. I'm not insulting you. But let me tell you this. By fire, by force. You can't be under my leadership and stay the same. You shall move forward by fire, by force. Uh, some people say they want to jackpot, jackpot. How will you jackpot? By sea. You don't even have passport and you want to <laughs> with that time <laughs> put you inside luggage. Praise the Lord. Enjoy your single. Enjoy your you see, if you are truly enjoying your single state of life, you will not be desperate for marriage. Marriage will be an addition. It will be like the dessert, it will not be the main course. Some people, all they are living for is just to get married, get married. And just like what we read earlier in the scriptures, you know, they are, they are stagnant. Their life is just on the same spot. You see, marriage for them is more like a rescue. There are people who get married because they want to leave home. And people with such attitudes most times end up missing it in marriage. Some people say, by 25, I don't want to be in my parents' house. So any guy that just shows up, say, Yes. <laughs> so when, before you say I do, you better know what you are going to do. Just say I do, I do, I do. What are you going to do? You don't even <laughs> praise God. <laughs> the third thing you need to know about being single is that it is a face that should be strategically maximized. Maximize that season of your life. Maximize it. Because you will never get it back. You will never get it back. You will never get it back. Maximize it. Use that season to develop yourself. Use that season to grow yourself. Use that season to cultivate alliances. Hmm. The fourth thing you need to understand about being single is that it gives you an opportunity for personal growth and career development like no other season in your life. You want to do some certification courses? Start now. Not when you get married. Start now. You say, you know, uh, when I get married, after my first baby, I will now go. Oh. <laughs> In fact, you just told us the reason why you will never do it. The fifth thing you need to realize about being single, right, is that when you are single, or sorry, who you are as a single is most likely who you will be as a married person. You know, I've told us that marriage does not change you. It only amplifies who you are. Some people just assume, that's why, do, do you know who I am? I'm a married man. So, 
If you don't have respect as a single, marriage will not make us respect you. In fact, we would only wonder who was stupid enough to submit himself to herself to you. So some men want people to respect them because they are married. You know, I have somebody like you at home. <laughs> when they get involved in that girl. Money ruin the story. It's not about that. If you are not honorable as a single, you cannot be an honorable as a married person. In fact, we only pity whoever married you like, ah, ah. and this one who has a wife. Ah, what a shame. The sixth thing you need to realize about being single is that how you utilize your season of singlehood is what will determine the quality of your marriage. How you utilize that season. How you utilize it. It will determine, you see, because who you bring into marriage matters. Who you bring. What quality of human being, what quality of man, what quality of woman is going into that institution? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Am I going into that institution as I desire to get married? Am I going into that institution, right, as an addition or as a minus? See, let me tell you this. Marriage is not a contract. It is a covenant, right? But there should be a strategic approach to it. Never get married to somebody that you cannot say definitely, this is what they are coming to add to my life. And let me tell you this, beauty is not an addition. Now why do you want to marry her? Because she's beautiful. That's not an addition. It's not, it doesn't have economic value. Beauty does not have a, you go to the bank now, you say, you know, I, I, I want to withdraw 10 million. I say, why? My wife is beautiful. <laughs> Look at you. I say, are you a comedian? <laughs> we know you came here to make us laugh, so... <laughs> You know, it's not, it doesn't have economic value. Beauty is good. But it has no economic value. Hmm. As a woman, they can't promote you at work because of the achievement of your husband. See, two shall become one. But let me tell you this. The success of the person you marry does not automatically culminate in your success. Many African women need to understand that. Or African women need to understand that. They say, ah, you know, ah, that guy, you know, why do you want to marry the guy? No, he's comfortable. He's comfortable. That's fine. Nobody is saying you should go into marriage to go and suffer. Do you understand what I'm saying? But the fact that he's doing well on the job does not automatically mean you will do well. You are supposed to be a plus. You are supposed to be an addition. Your spouse should wake up sometimes in the middle of the night, look at you and say, Father, I thank you. What a plus. Not, ah! Kimo <laughs> bad heavy. <laughs> like the story of a man. <laughs> you know, I had that story from a dear man of God. He said, that man watches his, you know, church service wedding every day, the video. He said, ah! Wow, you must really have enjoyed that day. He said, no. He said, I watch it in reverse. So I start from the end. He said, so, instead of saying how you dance, he said, I will remove the ring, dance out of the church. <laughs> because that is what he wished could happen. <laughs> so he watches it every day in reverse. You know? So please, be valuable. Always ask yourself, as a lady, as a guy, what value am I going to add? What value? And don't tell me I will pray for him. Mm -mm. Dads, of course, will you be cursing him before? <laughs> you know, anybody that marries me is covered spiritually. Story. What do I want to add? What do I want to add? Oh, he has a business. Oh, a successful business. That's why he wants to marry him. Can he come home one day and have, you know, be going through something in business and you'll be able to give him an idea that we get him out of that, you know, a, a crisis in business. Well, I just said, don't worry, it will be well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Do you still like me? Yeah. To experience God's ultimate for your marital destiny, there are three things I'll just talk about tonight that you need to wait for. Number one, wait for sex. Wait for what? Wait for sex. Society tells you 
that if you don't have sex, you can't enjoy your relationship. But let me tell you this. I think I spoke, it was on Sunday we spoke about that. Things your parents didn't know and could not tell you about sex. How many of us learned things that you never knew before on Sunday? It will help you. If you didn't, get that, if you didn't hear that message, go to the website. I think it's already on the website, right? Is it on the website, media? So go there and listen to it. If you are going to experience God's best in your marriage, you must learn to wait for sex. You must learn to wait. You see, just like I said on Sunday, I'm not saying this out of condemnation. I'm saying this out of understanding. What you are getting, you may know. What you are losing, you don't know. The problem in the life of David started the day he slept with Bathsheba. That was the day his problem started. That was the day the problem started. It was the sleeping with Bathsheba that gave birth, you know, to his... You see, because the moment... The Bible says it that breaks a, the egg, the serpent will bite. There are certain things that the moment you start involving it, you open the door, you give the devil access into your life and family. So you see the spirit of incest entering into his family. His son, who is supposed to be head to the throne, who is supposed to be learning how to govern a nation, he was learning how to strategize on how to rape the sister. He was supposed to be thinking about the throne. How do you govern a nation? How do you grow the economy? He wasn't seeing that. All he was seeing was his sister. Which eventually gave birth to an Absalom that killed his own brother who eventually now attempted to overthrow his father. David slept against Bash, uh, with Bathsheba in public. His own son, Absalom, slept with his wives in public, in the sight of all Israel. He did it in private. The seed, the harvest came as his own son, not even sleeping with his wife, raping his wives in public. So learn to wait for sex. If you want to enjoy God's best for your life, wait for it. Let me tell you, you will have enough of it. You might even get to a point in marriage that you, they will be begging you for it. What it seems as if you, if you don't do it now, you will die. Let me tell you this. In marriage, sex is work. Sometimes you might even need to plan it. That's if you are serious-minded anyway. Because there are some people, that's what they do every day. And their result shows it. I don't know how many of us saw the video during lockdown of a woman in Mushi who was, that man was so shameless. He said, <laughs> the woman said, ah, that's what we've been doing since lockdown. <laughs> and the woman said, enough is enough. Jobless man. Hmm. According to Center for Disease Control and Prevention and National Institute of Health, they say about 3% of Americans, that's 5 million, currently remain celibate until their honeymoons. So just like I told us on Sunday, if you think everybody is doing it, everybody is not. Don't be deceived. Elijah thought everybody had bowed to Baal until God told him there are 7,000. 7,000. So a lot of people say, you know, it's a normal thing. Everybody is doing it. That's why a lot of Christians today now even do it. See, if you don't do it, a lot of guys will not marry you. It's like there's, a, there's no guy that wants to marry something he has not tasted. So I become suya. So they're now tasting you, tasting you. Once they taste you, they say, hard more, hard more. You know, it's not every time you go to an aboki to buy suya that you get tasting that you buy. So someone tastes you, you say, no, no, it's not sweet enough. Another person comes. Before you know it, your self-esteem is eroded. Your sense of self-dignity is destroyed. By the time you even eventually get married, you are in pieces. You are no whole anymore. Because your self-esteem has been damaged. Wait for it. Wait for it. Let me tell you this. The Bible says the days of ignorance, God has winged that. There are things you may not know, but now that you are hearing it, make up your mind. If you've been engaged in that lifestyle, make up your mind that from tonight, I'm not going to have sex until I get married. It is possible. It is very possible. It is very, very possible. There's a book, you know, I, I've forgotten, you know, um, Megan Good or something like that. She's an Hollywood actress. I was surprised when she got married, you know, got married to this guy too. I've forgotten his name. I got their book sometime last year. The Weight, that's even the title of the book. You would expect that Hollywood celebrities, normal, we have sex before they got married. They wrote a book on it, how they waited before they got married. 
Not even Nollywood celebrity. Because those are the ones, those stupid ones are copying. Hollywood. You can check it online. Megan Good. I think that's her name. You know, smallish in stature. Some of us, you know, movie lovers, you know the person I'm talking about. When you have sex with someone outside of marriage, you are not just setting off a chain of chemical reactions in your brain that makes you think they are a lot better for you than they probably are. You are giving them a part of your spirit. That's what they said in that book. It says when you have sex with someone, you really are leaving them a piece of yourself and taking a part of them with you, whether you want to or not. So each sex partner, good or bad, becomes a part of your future. I explained this to us on Sunday. Number two, wait for God's best. Wait for God's best. Learn to wait for God's best. You see, you must value. That's why, you know, I should not be mentioning yesterday. For those of us that know, come, we have. <laughs> that's why we took the test we took yesterday. Make sure, learn to value yourself so much that you get to that point where you realize I deserve the best. I deserve. Many of us, the way we carry ourselves is as if, you know, this one too, you see, I have a mantra. Whatever is just okay is not okay for me. It's not because of my personality tilt or because I'm a perfection. If it is just okay, it is not okay. It's not okay. As a single, get to that point where you make up your mind that anybody you get married to, you'll be able to say, this is the best I could have gone for. Yeah. Not that of, you know, Kasha Muka. Let's just marry one. No, don't do that to yourself. You are worth more than that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You deserve more. Learn to wait for God's best. And let me tell you this. If you have not found God's best, the Bible says no man knows the things of a man like the spirit of that man that is on the inside of him. If you have not found God's best, you will know. I'm not telling you about society, society standard of best. Like you must have a G-Wagon, have a, see, all those things. It's about moving from point A to point B. You know, it's just a different way and status in which you move. Do you understand what I'm saying? Anybody that does not drive a G-Wagon today might drive the latest one in 10 years' time. So that's not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about materialism. I'm talking about somebody that will contribute to your destiny. Somebody that will give you peace. In marriage, let me tell you this. Peace is one of the most important things. I ask people that are married. All the things you think are important now. If they take peace out, you will exchange those things overnight in 24 hours for peace. That's how you know God's best. You are able to say with conviction, this person will give me peace, male or female. You are able to say that with conviction. This person will help me to fulfill destiny. The person may not be called to do what I'm doing, but this person will support me to fulfill my destiny. This person will be an addition, not a subtraction. If you can't say that with confidence, you have not found God's best. And don't look at the clock. Nobody set a clock for you. There is no way it is written in the Bible that you must be married at 25, or you must be married at 30, or you must be married at 45. There is no way it is written in the Bible. You look at someone like Cindy Trim. How many of us know Cindy Trim, Dr. Cindy Trim? Who do you guys know? <laughs> Cindy Trim got married two years ago. This was a woman that everybody already thought, you know, she's a very good friend to my pastor. You know, every time she comes to Nigeria, you know, very wonderful woman. She has been a consultant for government. In fact, me, I never thought she could marry again. You know, like, who still thinks of marriage at that age? But the kind of person she got married to is as if after her marriage, everything just tripled. What she was doing? She waited for God's best. My first lady will say, it is better to wait long than marry wrong. Better to wait long than marry wrong. And you know, before you meet God's best, you will meet different types of people. Before Eve showed up, Adam met animals. And he didn't choose any of them. He was patient enough. Could it be you are going for animals instead of waiting for your Eve? Learn to wait until you are ready. That's the third thing you must learn to wait for. Wait until you are ready. Wait until you are ready. Wait until you are ready. And just like I said a moment ago, age is not synonymous to readiness. Age is not what? I want to be sure you heard me. Let's say it seven times. Two. Three. 
Is that everybody? Four. Five. Six. Seven. For the eighth time, shout it. So age is not synonymous already. You need to get that. Okay, at, this, at this age. Can you use age to collect money at the bank? You enter the bank. So at, at my age, I should be able to collect 10 million naira. It's not about your age. Who cares? Like, I look at me now. Someone like me. I should not like have 10 million naira. It's not about your age. It's about what have you been able to put in the bank. It's what you have been able to put there that determines what you can get out. So wait until you're ready. Wait until you're ready. Wait until you're ready. Don't let people push you out of God's timing for your life. As much as possible, I've tried to be open with to us about my life. I've told us, you know, at a certain age where my mom would always call me, you know, that, you know, you know people, some people will not put pressure on you directly. It's through prayer. So by this time next year, I know that when I'm praying for you, it's you and your wife. You know, I'm really trusting God for you. If you are trusting God for me, keep your prayer. Am I the one that wants to answer your prayer? Pray to God. Why are you telling me your prayer point? I don't need to know. And some of us might need to be polite and put a stop to such conversations. Wait until you're ready. How do you know you are ready? Areas to gauge readiness. Spiritual readiness. Gauge your spirituality. <laughs> Let me tell you this. There is a demand that will be placed on your spirituality as a married person. And that kind of demand, you will not experience it as a single. Why? Because when you get married, you are attaching someone else's destiny to yours. So if <laughs> you are a spiritual midget, make sure you become a spiritual giant before you get married. It will help you. Because the challenges you will face in marriage, nobody will prepare you for it. You may never know. Spiritual readiness. Areas in which you also need to check spiritual readiness according to God's standard. I think we read this last week, Wednesday, Ephesians chapter 6, or was it on um, Sunday? Is you must be ready as a man to be the head. When I say you should be ready to be the head, I'm not talking about, oh, of course now, yes, I'm ready, I'm ready to be the head. <laughs> if many men understood what it means to be the head, they will take their time. They will choose more wisely. Spiritual readiness simply means you are ready to lead a home. You are, see, if you have not led yourself, you can't lead somebody else. If they still have to be telling you what you should do with your life, they still have to be following you up as a man about what you need to do for your own life. You are not ready. You are not ready. A man that does not have a quiet time cannot lead a home. A man that does not have a personal relationship with God cannot lead a home. A man that only reads his Bible once a year. A man that only goes to church every Christmas or crossover service cannot lead a home. Because being the head of a home is a spiritual responsibility. And it is more than dropping money. It is more than being able to afford house rent. It's more than that. It is being able to pick up the responsibility of another destiny. Let me tell you this. As men, you need to realize that you will give account of how you lead your home. I hope we know. In case you don't know, it's better you know from tonight. You give an account. You give an account. Don't be a lead. Be a leader. A lead hinders people's progress. A leader pushes people forward. Many men are leads. They are not leaders. A lead places a limit on your capacity. A lead says you have come this far, you will go no further. A lead is a man that when a woman gets married to him, the success of the woman stops. The last certification she had is the last she will ever have. She, she dies. That's a lead. A lead is a man that when the woman got married to him, the woman looks worse off. 
our glory begins to diminish instead of our light shining for all to see. Let me tell you this. If a man is doing his job well, more men should ask your woman out after marriage than before she got married. Oh, deep. I'm serious. Because the things that she did not even know that she had, you bring it out. Let me tell you this. When a woman is fulfilled, her beauty will radiate. There's nobody that is not beautiful. It's just that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> but there's nobody that is not beautiful. Praise the Lord. When you invest in her, her glory will go out. Her glory will come forth. Hmm. For a woman, spiritual readiness means we are ready to submit. Let me tell you this. There is no progressiveness in thinking that can change God's standard. All these feminist movements want to be part of them. Continue. <laughs> you see, did you even know that the real meaning of feminist, if you, the real dictionary meaning, all of us should be feminists. But the feminism this generation is practicing is not true feminism. Their feminism is rebellion in the home. It's rebellion. It's no, as if nobody saying you should not have a mind of your own. But when you wanted to get married, it's because we believe you have an understanding that as a woman, I've sized this guy up. I believe he has enough sense to lead me to my destiny. So I'm deciding to follow him. I want to believe the reason why you are coming to a place like the gateway is because you believe I can bring out the best in you and I can lead you. Yes or yes? I want to believe that. In case that is not what you believe. If you are just here, maybe you should go and pray to God. Am I supposed to be here? Because I don't expect you to be in a church that you don't think can hurt to you. How many of us has been blessed since you came? So I want to believe you are in the right place. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So that's what it means as a woman to marry. It simply means we have sized this guy up. I said, this guy, I believe he knows what he's doing. You can't be in marriage and be arguing. All the time, argue. It simply means you are not ready to serve. It means you don't believe in the leadership of that guy. Then why did you marry him? There is nothing wrong with the guy. You are the one something is wrong with. Because it simply means this guy cannot lead you. And you were stupid enough to submit yourself to him. How would you do that to yourself? Spiritual readiness simply means I'm ready to follow God's ordained standard, God's ordained method, that as a woman, as a wife, I must submit to my own husband. That's what the Bible says. Why submit to your own husband? Your own husband, not husbands. Your own husband. Because some people can take that now. In this age of social media, you know, and loop it. Say, husbands. You see, even Pastor Kito has someone that teaches on relationship. So I said, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's a, I said wives. But you guys understand the context. So in case, let me rephrase. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The man should be the head of the home. The woman should be able to submit to the leadership in the home. You know the reason why there are so many rebellious children nowadays? Go and check it. They came from rebellious homes check it. A child that grows up in a home where the child sees mommy submitting to daddy's leadership will not have a problem submitting as a woman to her husband. But when daddy says one, she has said ten. The child just believes that should be the normal thing. And you know what they say in this generation? They say, no, I'm, I'm expressing myself. Are you saying I should not have my opinion? That's what they say. You know, every, uh, my truth. You know, I'm, I'm expressing my truth. My truth. Nonsense truth. As a woman who finds it difficult submitting in marriage, the question is, didn't you get the memo? That as a woman you are supposed to submit. Is it that you missed your address? Also financial readiness. Of course, you know I'll talk about that. Financial readiness. What is financial readiness? The capacity to make and manage resources. So, you see, let me tell you this. Somebody can be earning 10 million naira per month. It doesn't mean they are financially ready. Because some people, with that 10 million, before the end of the month, they are still borrowing. There are people like that. No matter how much they earn, the money can never be enough. 
So financial readiness is not about the amount he's earning. Financial readiness is about how he's able to manage the resources. As a man, you should be able to give us an account of how you expended the money that came into your hand. Somebody hearing what I'm saying? If you can't tell us where 100,000 is going, what will happen when you start handling 100 million? If 100 million will put you in a greater trouble. Financial readiness. It's also the ability to get and keep a job as a man or as a woman. The ability to get and keep a job. So check it before you start falling in love. Can that man keep a job? Can that woman keep a job? What are some of the things you need to check? And as an individual, you also need to ask yourself. How you, one of the ways you know you are financially ready. Is that, okay, some of them say job, okay. Can they keep a business? There are people that I know in the last five years that I've known them, they've done 20 business. Those are wrong people to marry. Because it simply means they are unstable. And now you do one thing is how you do everything. If you are unstable in your own job, in your business, you will be unstable in marriage. It's a character flaw. Ten years from now, I'll still be doing what I'm doing. Twenty years, I'll still be doing this. That's consistency. That's character. Financial readiness is also the ability to have something you can exchange for money in the marketplace. It simply means you are able to see that even if you don't have a job, you know, even if you don't, you know, they say, oh, there is no enough job. Okay, what can I do to exchange for money in the marketplace? There is something God has given everybody. Stop complaining about the economy. There is something you can do in exchange for money. There is always something. Also, emotional readiness. Emotional readiness is the ability to put your emotions in check and undo pressure with grace. Some of us are saying, I, I want to get married. I'm ready to get married. Any little thing, you're already crying. You're not ready, you. Because they're married, you will cry very well. You say, you know me, that's just how I cry. Ah. <laughs> oh, dear. Hmm. Ability to undo pressure with grace. Pressure. Okay, thank God nobody is praying for bad luck or anything. What happens? You marry this guy. I've heard of someone who lost his job on the day of the reception. And it happens. It happens. The story of someone I heard, you know, some of us, if you are active online and you know this person, you know who I'm talking about. Their husband lost the job on the day they gave birth to their son. You just got a baby rejoicing and you got sack letter. So what should he be doing at the naming ceremony? So what is the name of his <laughs> What happened? I just lost my job. Some men will do that. In fact, some men will not do that, but you will already know something is wrong. His equilibrium will be messed up. Abilities to undo pressure. Because marriage comes with pressure. See some people, the, um, lack of emotional readiness. Some people, you see, <laughs> because of baby, they'll be getting late to work. Is that right? Uh, because I had to take you, you that wanted to give birth, you didn't know you will bath your baby. You have a client meet, you say, uh, It's because you know, Junior did not wake up on time. You can't beat him to wake up, <laughs> you know, because this generation is saying you should not beat children. So, a child that is sleeping that you wake that is not waking up, it's conversation you used to wake him up, Junior. Wake up. I have the client meeting. I get out and give him. Are <laughs> oh, you power down here? Wake up straight. Because of your slothfulness, I will now lose the contract. You know, emotional readiness, ability to handle conflict. Some people can manage conflict. Some people just they would rather avoid it until the conflict grows, grows, grows until the day they explode and everything else scatters. The ability to manage anger. It's part of emotional readiness. You know. Also social readiness. 
social readiness is the ability to cultivate and maintain new relationships. Let me tell you this. The relationships you have as a single, this is one thing many people don't hear. You will need more relationships as a married person. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You can't use the relationship you have as a single and say those are, you see, you will need new, nobody say you will ditch your single friends, but you will, need, you will need new set of friends as a married person. Because there are things that as a married person you can't talk to your single friends about, they will never understand. In fact, to tell them is even detrimental to your marriage. They can give you the counsel of a single. And if you apply that counsel, your marriage can end. Say, ah, how will they be talking to you like that? So what did you tell him? No, 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 you should have expressed your mind. Uh, <laughs> she is her boyfriend she's expressing her mind to she is telling you she's giving you the counsel of a girlfriend not the counsel of a wife and many are not wise enough to understand the difference because you it is boyfriend and girlfriend you can end at any time married person there are so many attachments social readiness you must learn as a single, planning to get married, how to win friends and influence people. There's a book on that about Dale Carnegie. One of the you know, best books you can read in your life. Write it down and get it. Get it and read it. Not as a decoration on your table. I want to say, ah, I admit I have that book. I have it. Knowledge is not transferred through osmosis. By eating it on your head. Yes, I know it. Social readiness. You need social skills to succeed maritally because you need to relate to people you never had to relate with before. You have to relate with in-laws. You have to relate with, you know, you are not just going to relate with your own family. You will relate with another person's family. And you must learn to manage that family well. You learn to manage their weakness. You learn to manage their excesses. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I know in this generation, a lot of women want this idea of uh, my, my, my husband to myself. There is nothing like that. Though. Don't let anybody deceive you. And there are some men who say, no, it's me and my wife. That's nonsense. Before you marry somebody, check the family. Am I comfortable with this family? You are not just marrying the person, you are marrying their family also. So this idea of, no, 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 you know, no. His mom will not be visiting us all the time, you know. In fact, they will call before they come. Oh, they don't marry my kind of mother-in-law. You see, she will call. Next, I just say, I'm at your door. <laughs> I saw a problem with that, but even I look forward to it. Not because there are wisdom you glean from old women and old men. There's a wisdom you glean from the agent. So even me now, sometimes I look forward to it. Praise the Lord. So if you don't have social intelligence, how will you do that? You'll be fighting with your mother-in-law. He said, no, 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 mommy, you did not tell us you were coming before you came. No, we don't like all this, you know, no, 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 no. <laughs> and they gave you their daughter. Or their son. You want to marry somebody's son, you don't want to see the father. You don't want to see the mother. <laughs> I laugh in Spanish. And last but not the least for tonight is career readiness. Career readiness. What is career readiness? That simply has to do with what you want to do with your life. You can't tell me you are thinking of marriage when you are clueless about where you are going. That's why I said earlier, before you say I do, you must ask yourself, what am I going to do? You can't just say, you know, no, I'm ready to get married. Why? You know, I'm 25. I'm looking forward to my 38th birthday. You know, I want to be in my husband's house by the time I'm 30. Do you know what you are going to do with your life? You know, like I said yesterday, I believe in early marriage. But one of the risks of early marriage, I'm not saying it is wrong, but one of the risks that research has discovered is people discover themselves in marriage. And really, you should have discovered yourself before you got married. Because we've seen people who discover themselves in marriage, and the discovery made them realize this is not the person they should have married. You now realize that, ah, now I want to be this. So, ah, no, 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 no. So they now begin to see the home as a prison. That they must break. And such people now be praying. They might not pray it out, but they now be praying, God, can you just take him? <laughs> Do you know this? Hmm. 
if you know things people like us are privileged to hear, there are women and men secretly praying for the death of, because you know that, that what excuse will I give to exit? So, but God, if you can just take her. Some have not even prayed it out, but it's in their thoughts. You know, it will be a very good way of escape. So, someone loses his wife today. In three months' time, he got married. He has been planning the death. Because how do you see somebody in three months and marry the person in three months? It means it's what the plan was already in motion. We were just waiting for the approval. <laughs> God just kill her. So the moment she died, cry. <laughs> but you know, I say, you know, as a man, I don't want to fall into fornication. I don't want to fall into fornication. But you met under three months. And the plan was already in motion. It was in motion. Let's just tell us the truth. So career readiness. Find out where you are going. You see, let me tell you this. And these things will not drop into your lap. Oh, that's why the foundation of everything is spiritual readiness. As a single, one of the things you can do in this season of your life is to develop a strong relationship with God. Spend time in the place of prayers. Spend time praying a lot in tongues. Many of those things will come during in a place of prayers. In the place of praying extendedly in tongues. Things will just come to you. You might not be able to say, this is how I know them, but you will just know them. You will just know them. You will receive clarity. Confusion will reduce in your life when you pray a lot in tongues. That time you are using to run after girls that they are giving you nails. One, two, everywhere. Spend that time praying. God will lead you to the person that before you even, while you are here speaking, he has answered. <laughs> Have you been blessed tonight? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the seed of your word that has been sown in our hearts.